Hi guys, I have a very spicy recap for you today. I am here with a round eight. I had the white pieces against Luigi and Luigi is uh, actually somebody I met earlier in the tournament because him and his friends are staying at the same hotel as most of the streamers. So um, I met him on like day one, I think. And so because I knew that him and his friends knew all of the streamers, I actually saw that he played Anna Cramling in round two. Um, I was a little bit stressed actually because I kind of always prefer to play somebody who is a completely blank slate, like a stranger. I have no other ties in any way. I didn't really know Luigi, so it was okay. Much better than playing a friend. Now Luigi and I are friends. We all had dinner together as a group. We're all best of friends now. Not saying that Luigi... Anyway, moving on. Luigi is a great guy, but I had to win this game because I felt as though I played very, very badly yesterday in round seven. Uh, if you watched the recap, you will know. If you didn't watch the recap, then actually round seven is probably the only recap I'm gonna ask you don't watch because I just played so badly. You can watch all of the other recaps, just not that one. And so I felt pressure to win and I was actually quite stressed and I was in a little bit of a bad mood. <laughs> um, uh, this is becoming a recurring theme. But actually what I did was I took the morning um, to do other things. So I went to the zoo I'd kind of been wanting to go to the zoo the whole trip and um, somebody in my Twitch chat said it's like in the Queen's Gambit when Beth Harmon is about to play Borgov and then she goes to the zoo in Mexico City but then actually she sees Borgov at the zoo I did not see Luigi at the zoo he was not there um, and then I uh, did some prep before the game with my coach so I saw that Luigi played the Sicilian my friend told me that he played the Sveshnikov because my friend had analyzed with him at the chess party convenient. I don't play the open Sicilian, so Sveshnikov not gonna happen, but I do play the Smith Mora. If you remember from my round uh, six recap, I said how sometimes I play silly things like the Smith Mora. I had seen that Luigi does not accept the gambit, and so I'm really playing at no risk here. I had seen that Luigi plays knight to f6, and so this is a direct transposition to the Alapin. The Alapin Sicilian is a bit like the Smith Mora, except you don't gambit a pawn. It's not so um, risky. And d6 is attacking our pawns in the center. It's the main move. Um, knight to f3. There's actually a little move order trick that white can play here. We can play knight to f3 now if we want because they cannot take because the knight is hanging. But I just played uh, c takes. It transposes anyway. And then knight to c6, bishop to c4, knight to b6, and then bishop to b5. This is theory. So I know it seems very strange because the bishop has moved twice, but this is exactly as... Uh, this variation is played. So here the main move is captures. We are forced to take with a knight because if we take with a pawn then as you can see queen takes queen and we are not getting any castling rights as white. We're losing our castling rights. So let me turn on the evaluation bar for you. Of course we don't want to lose our castling rights and so we are forced to take with the knight and this gives us an isolated pawn. So the isolated queen's pawn. Uh, if you're new to chess you might not know about it. Uh, pros and cons to this. I, I'm not familiar. I don't play with many isolated queens positions but it gives white good attacking chances in co uh, in contrast it's a weakness in the end game this was the main line but my opponent plays bishop to d7 and whenever i prepare for an opening as well as looking at the main line i always look at moves where i th i think oh i would panic if they played that so even if the move is not very good bishop to d7 is good this is a move here but i i'm always like oh my gosh what if they played this crazy move that would really really stress me out and then i like to prepare for it in advance so i had prepared for bishop to d7 because i just thought what if he doesn't take so the difference here now i can tell you the difference is that if black takes at a later point we can now take with the pawn because as you, as you can see the bishop blocks black's queen's view of white's queen and so we would not have to take on the isolated queen's pawn position and this is kind of a perk for me because i am not very familiar with those positions so i was quite happy but i uh, i had actually forgotten anything after this point so as you can see i spent it says i only spent three minutes here but i felt like i spent longer let me check my trusty score sheet and of course I did not start notating time until later. Uh, here I almost blundered. I almost played castles and castles is not so much a blunder as a mistake because knight takes e5 as possible and it means if I took here then takes would just win black a clean pawn. Apparently here uh, I just checked with the engine now there is knight takes um bishop takes knight takes king takes queen h5 check i'm not convinced i would have seen all of this um obviously i'd be happy with this position this would be 
this would be quite nice to have with the queen with the king here but uh i didn't uh play castles so i did not allow this knight capture on e5 i played knight c3 to avoid it because now this knight tactic does nothing as the bishop on b5 is not hanging after the knight moves away so i played knight to c3 uh black plays e6 and here I was going to castle, but I suddenly became afraid of a6. What I had seen was that if castle's a6, my bishop wants to be on uh, d3, but then this allows knight b4, which meant that bishop b1 was necessary, and then something else, uh, and I would have to kick the knight away later. And I just thought that this gave black time. I know that my bishop is still in the diagonal it wants to be on and I can play for queen d3. I was actually just very happy to never allow knight b4. And so this is why I again delayed castling in this position and instead I played a3. I had seen that in some variations of this Alapin line where I was doing the thing where I look up oh my gosh what would happen if they didn't do this i looked up what would happen if black didn't ever play um d6 because d6 was the move i was expecting right here and i knew that if black didn't play d6 i would panic if i hadn't looked at it in advance so if he had played something for example like e6 then i believe that a3 is possible so knight f3 um something and then and then a3 yes stockfish is on my side now with a3 this is because in this variation where black does not undermine the pawn chain we don't need to play for bishop c4 we're never really going to take it and also we don't really want to play knight c3 immediately because if they play a delayed uh, d6 then something about having awkward these two pawns being quite awkward. So this is what my coach and I discussed before the game. So anyway, yes, I had seen a3 in this kind of line and I thought that I could combine the two because my king is under no risk and I'm very ready to castle at any time. And so I thought, why not throw an a3 now um, so that when the time is right, I can simply play bishop to d3 without having any worries of this knight coming down to b4. Bishop e7. And actually here I did look quite a few times at if I wanted to capture this pawn, but I actually thought that um, it was worse for me. Again, taking on the isolated queen's pawn position for no reason. And I don't think that this tempo gain on black actually does anything because my pawn structure is just worse so here instead I just castled black castled here I was already considering bishop back to d3 because this is starting to look like your classic greek gift position but I thought it might be slightly premature and so I played rook to e1 now rook to e1 uh, is not one of the top moves the engine is giving me here um apparently and this is something one of my common what something my commentator said today queen uh e2 uh, is more more thematic and then when I go bishop back to d3 i play queen to e4 and i have the queen bishop battery and i swing the queen round at some point maybe to h4 obviously not whilst the bishop is here but but the queen infiltrates this way and in the normal smith mora like when they take the pawn i'm very used to playing queen e2 uh putting my rooks on the dnc and uh proceeding like that but this was no longer in my mind a smith mora this was an alapin and i don't know that much about the alapin but i hadn't looked at queen e2 so i thought rookie one was normal because essentially what i had seen on my opponent's online games was that he played a few games in this line where his opponent got an excellent kingside attack but pretty much all of those kingside attacks from the opponent uh included a rook lift so like rookie three or rookie four and bringing the rook over to the h file later so i thought in order to do so rookie one was necessary uh rook to c8 and bishop back to d3 so this bishop has moved three times but all with very very good reasons and now it is on its perfect diagonal and the beautiful thing about a3 is that it is very difficult to kick this bishop away so i was very very happy with my position here and i was kind of always looking at what happens if takes takes i actually thought that in this position i would play knight takes the engine is telling me that d takes is better but basically what I'd seen is that here and um, knight takes here I obviously have either a bishop h7 queen h5 queen g4 or okay the engine's main move here is bishop e3 i which i didn't didn't see but apparently this is really really spicy i guess yeah because of this bishop stuff and then the queen knight x-ray on d7 yeah so i thought maybe knight takes but apparently d takes is better and just keeping this clamp on these two squares and, and i thought that maybe if we got this kind of thing i would just have a bit more of a normal smith mora position now this kind of looks more more smith mora -y, kind of we can get a lot of activity on the d file we can maybe put a piece on d6 at some point i don't know we get the 
a queen bishop. We put a rook here. I'm not sure. Uh, this is just a game of chess, but white's position is nice. But here, actually, um, my opponent was very afraid. And I thought with valid reason. I thought that if my opponent played something random, I thought maybe this worked. Uh, it doesn't, though. I thought here, and then after knight, check, bishop here, queen here, and then this way and then I thought that if um bishop back then maybe there was something here but actually there isn't um not even after knight here because of f5 so I did not see this but this was not what was played apparently what my commentator told both of us after the game when Luigi and I analyzed with him was that I would need to deflect this bishop away first so I'd need to play something in this position like uh takes and then maybe go for the Greek gift or something uh no it's still not working but um it was it looked very tempting in this position but my opponent I thought he was maybe gonna play something like g6 or he was going to try to cover any potential knight g5 or or whatever's i mean it's not possible right now but uh after maybe knight e4 knight g5 or uh whatever my opponent plays f5 and he was afraid of my attack and i also very much believed i had an attack this looks very greek gifty <laughs> And so I was very happy after e takes en passant because now um, I have this move knight to e4. So I spent quite a while on this move. I spent 15 minutes because I wasn't sure if there was better, basically. But it's telling me that, that this is best. Um, followed by bishop to b1, I'm guessing, preparing to put the queen on um, d3 and have that same queen bishop battery. So lots of the same ideas being combined, but I thought knight e4 was very, very natural because obviously we're attacking the bishop and we're attacking the weak d6 pawn at the same time. I thought that if d5, I can play like this, plus one, but apparently taking the bishop is just better. Queen takes, and I guess um, I had looked very briefly at this. I thought... I didn't think it was as amazing as it's telling me it is, but... Oh, bishop h4 is an idea I had not seen. Preparing queen to... Uh, sorry, preparing knight to g5. And then maybe later queen here. That's very, very nice. It's a very cool idea from Stockfish. I don't think I would have seen bishop to h4. Because after bishop to g5, which I did look at, I, I didn't really see a follow-up. My opponent did not play d5. My opponent played bishop e8 and bishop e8 is a very creative idea the queen is now covering this pawn and his plan is to bring the bishop to h5 to pin my f3 knight which is very creative but um i was always looking at putting a piece on g5 and so here apparently i'm supposed to put this knight i put the wrong knight on g5 but this knight g5 idea essentially is coming with the attack on h7 i'm threatening to take but i'm also threatening this fork now after the bishop has moved to a e8 from d7 so this has actually uh made my attack stronger i think this bishop e8 move it was it was a cool idea but it's actually now allowing um threats of this fork of knight takes e6 yeah, here I wasn't sure if he was going to play for takes takes and then um, I did look kind of a little bit at this and then queen takes uh, here at some point. Maybe I just have time in this variation for bishop b3 but there were lots of lines uh, where I calculated queen f6, queen takes f2 and I have to play king h1 and black gets some activity even though he's worse. I'll show you another a line where I actually looked at that where it was possible but basically what happened was um, my opponent took on d4 which I was obviously um convinced that here here and here i just win the bishop and so i spent quite a lot of time calculating other things so i calculated this line but here uh and here i was originally just going to take take and fork but when my opponent spent his time thinking i saw that i had better than this fork but this fork is still very nice but i saw that i had this amazing idea uh knight takes i did not get to play this in the game because we didn't get this variation but knight takes and then queen f6 here is the variation here with queen takes but i have this amazing move which i thought worked bishop takes g5 i i was confused there because stockfish was not showing it as one of the top three moves and i guess maybe just there's slightly too much activity allowed because i saw bishop c6 and i was a bit spooked a little bit spooked here but i mean i have either bishop back or rook here there is no mate no forced mate or anything but okay so it's telling me that there is even better than bishop takes bishop just winning a full piece i guess i should just take okay no now it is coming up as the second best so i should just take the the rook though and king takes and then bishop takes 
queen takes. But now I'm only up the exchange. I guess also this pawn is terrible. This pawn will fall. And I guess if bishop takes here, this is uh, not possible because of stuff here. Oh, that looks very unpleasant. I had not seen this, but yeah. Okay, well, I was going to win the bishop with bishop takes uh, g5. I thought this was very, very cool, but it's telling me stop being fancy, Lula, just take the rook. Whatever. There were lots of, this was a very sharp opening. There were lots of things going on. So I thought that my opponent was going to take this knight, but my opponent actually takes on uh, d4. And here I was confused because I thought this was worse. I thought this was worse because bishop takes, king take, oh. Bishop takes king h8, not take, sorry. It's like 11 p.m. And then just queen takes, and then we are up a piece. But I had missed this idea of rook takes c1. So I'd completely missed this. And here I was like, oh my god, I'm not up material. Or like after takes um, and queen takes, I'm up an exchange again. But like, I was like, I'm not up a piece. Like, this is uh, me being very greedy. Like, oh god, I'm not up a piece. Um, actually, I have a great position, and this is winning. But I thought, I thought, I thought, yeah, I must have something else. I must have something spicier in this position. And that is when I found the move queen to h4. Which is, it's, it's an amazing move, okay? It's, I know it's quite obvious once you have this position in front of you, but uh, it, took me, it took me a little bit because I had not seen it from knight takes d4. I didn't see it until the position was in front of me. So here, uh, actually, if you do not, um, I mean, you can try to stop the mate with trading the rooks but the only options really are to give up the queen like if you're trying to give up the bishop you're just going to have to give up the queen uh, as well you're just going to have to give up everything any other move trying to stop the checkmate does not work rook f4 i mean you give up the rook like you're gonna have to give away everything if you want to stop the mate but any random move and it is mate in two with um obviously the queen on h7. So in this position, my opponent played queen takes knight, queen takes and king takes. And obviously this is not a position anybody wants to be in. I was looking for some kind of forcing win. I was looking at queen e7. I thought it was very, very stylish, um, forcing the king back and then taking on e6 with check. Then I thought I have um, been too stylish already with my, my attempts to like great gift which clearly were never going to work. And I'm very lucky I didn't get to play them because I probably would have blundered. Uh, and I just grabbed the pawn because, I mean, it's a free pawn. And then it, it was a, at move 23 that uh, Luigi resigned the game. And then we went and analyzed because really there is not much to be done. Like, I'm just going to take more material or I'm going to, you know, I can also check. And then to just take more material. The queen and the rook are, are just much better here. And obviously um, you really need three pieces for the queen. Two is not enough. So uh, he decided it was not worth playing on, which I think is a valid, valid choice. So here really the blunder was um, grabbing my pawn on d4. Um, as you can see, I've had lots of uh, pseudo pawn sacrifices this tournament. And this is actually quite new for me. I'm not good at um, sacrificing pawns or sacrificing the exchange. And in this tournament, I've done both. Like, I just have. I was actually very happy with this game. And it turns out I played at like 97% accuracy or something. Um, but that being said, Luigi and I, when we discussed afterwards, like I, my moves were all very straightforward. After f5, the position was very easy for white to play because I, I am presented with like a very clear attack. And I was actually a bit nervous going into this because I am not usually very good at this kingside attacking stuff. And so as you can see, I, I spent quite a lot of time and then it was not until my opponent had already blundered that he started using his own time. Luigi spent 20 minutes on f5. Um, he was quite stressed by then already. So I was... Um, was very very happy with my position very very happy with my game and the moves that I found um especially queen 2h4 which I thought was a really really nice way to to finish um with the mate threat and this was just a very very good game for me and it just goes to show that even though I'm capable of horrible blunders like in yesterday's game I'm also capable of playing some good chess which is really really nice because I needed a bit 
of confidence back after after yesterday because I was quite embarrassed by how uh, early and badly I blundered. This this makes me feel good because it means that going into round nine, which is tomorrow morning, final round, morning round, I will probably have another tough pairing, but I will end the tournament with uh, gaining rating. I have scored now at least four points. So um, if I made a draw tomorrow, I would be scoring 50%. If I don't, then four out of nine is still good. And I've had some some tough uh, opponents, so I'm really proud of uh, this tournament. <laughs> It is definitely um, the highest level I've played at over the board. So I'm really, really um, happy that this is the tournament I shared with you guys uh, through recaps whilst it was going on because uh, if I was having like the worst tournament of my life and I was doing recaps, it would be much harder to continue. But yeah, I really, really hope you enjoyed this game. Um, it shows that the Alapin can be quite spicy and maybe, I don't know, maybe just accept the Smith Mora. I think that accepting it is fine if you if you know a line that that's um, solid. But yeah, I can see why a lot of people don't want to accept the gambit. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave a comment down below. What did you think of this game? Um, it's really nice to have a nice uh, little miniature win. We were finished, uh, I think in like three hours. So it's good because I've had tournaments before where I've played like five or six hours a day and it's exhausting. So it's nice to have some shorter games. Obviously, I'm not always on the winning end of those shorter games, but when you are, it's nice. And yeah, I will see you in the next recap tomorrow for the final round. Let's see how it goes. Until then, have a good one. Bye, guys.